Hi, I'm Jimin. In this video, we're looking at Beyond Meat, ticker symbol B-Y-N-D. Our goal with this video is to try to get an understanding of the fundamental business of Beyond Meat, look at where that business is going, how big it can be, and then hopefully we can look at the uh, at least the implied fair value of Beyond Meat stock. So Beyond Meat's IPO was just a few months ago at the start of May of 2019, where they started trading at about $25 a share. Well, since then, Beyond Meat is up about 580%. So let's look at the Beyond Meat business. So Beyond Meat operates in two main segments, fresh foods and frozen foods. Fresh foods accounted for 84% of 2018 revenue and frozen foods accounted for the other 16% of 2018 revenue. So what makes Beyond Meat so unique that its stock would jump as much as it has since it went IPO, well, it's that their food is 100% plant-based and they're designed to look, cook, and taste like traditional meats. Now, from a business perspective, what Beyond Meat has accomplished that's truly unique is that their products, specifically their Beyond Meat Burger, which is their flagship product, well, they're sold out of the meat case in grocery stores unlike their veggie burger competitors. So this could be a real advantage for them. And it's said that the Beyond Meat Burger and many of their other meats offer the same protein benefits that traditional meats offer. So our question is, how many of these can they sell? Well, one of the advantages of analyzing a company like this is that we get to look at their S1 filing. Now an S1 filing is just like an annual report, except it's way more in depth and it covers a lot more. The S1 filing is only filed, generally, when you first go public. So I bring this out because I got a lot of the information that I'm using for this video in the S1 filing. And then I tried to go to some other places where I thought the company might have a natural bias. So how big can they be? Well, let's try to project 10 years out. So in 2018, it's estimated that $1.4 trillion worth of meat was sold worldwide. Now, it's estimated that the meat market is going to grow by about 1.5% per year. So if we were to grow our 1.4 trillion out until 2029, which is 10 years from our current year and 11 years from our 2018 1.4 trillion, well, we end up with about $1.65 trillion in meat spent for 2029. So now we have to make a few more assumptions. First, let's assume that only half of the entire meat industry can actually have a similar product created with plant-based products. Now, Beyond Meat is doing this for pork, beef, and poultry. So management of Beyond Meat claims that they can actually do 100% of products out there. But let's be conservative and assume only half of the meat market will have a viable replacement with plant-based meats. That leaves us with a potential market for BYND of about $825 billion. Now we need to estimate how much of the population is willing to switch from traditional meats over to alternative meats like the Beyond Meat burger or Beyond Meat sausages or whatever it is. The best estimates I could find for this ranged anywhere from 9% to 15%. Now we could split the difference and call it 12%, but I'm a big fan of being conservative, so how about we call it 10% just to be on the safe side. So now 10% of our $825 billion switches and we end up with a potential market of $82.5 billion, and that's in 2029. Now these are global sales. The next thing we need to do is decide how much of the market is Beyond Meat going to control. Now, just as a reference point, Pepsi is said to have about 20% of the beverage market, and Coke is said to have about 40% of the beverage market. But they've been around for a really long time. So how about we say that Beyond Meat is going to control 5% of the alternative meat market by 2029? Now, this may be a bit conservative, but that's okay. So we're going to say that that's a total revenue of $4.1 billion. This is what a potential revenue chart would look like, assuming that we grew it from where it is now up to 2029. So for 2017 to 2018, those are historical numbers. 2019 through 2022, I took analyst estimates and everything beyond that, well, what we did is we tried to come up with a growth rate that would get us to 2029 to our estimated revenue number. So this is what the revenue growth rate would look like, assuming we sort of stair-stepped it down like that. The blue are historical numbers. Uh, those are actual numbers. And then the green numbers are the, are the analyst estimates. I took those exactly as they were. And then the yellow are what I added to try to get us to our final number. So when we look at this chart, I could easily make the case that the drop between 2019 and 2020, according to analysts, is a bit drastic. And may, maybe it makes more sense to have a more logical, progressive, downward sloping growth rate. 
But even if that were true, this still works the same because this ends up being fairly conservative if we think that their growth rate is accurate, first of all, for 2019 and 2020. And if we took a more conservative growth rate, then these R numbers end up being a bit more conservative, which I think works well. Now, here's where things get interesting. So you know what this chart doesn't account for? It doesn't account for new products. Beyond Meat is expected to come up with bacon, steaks, chicken cutlets, and who knows what else. And in theory, each time a new product was, would be added, we should see a pop in revenue. And that pop in revenue is likely to stick around, making these numbers even more conservative than just basing it off what we already had. And this brings us to the problem. So let's pretend that our numbers are way too conservative. And when we switch back to the revenue chart, well, let's pretend that our $4.1 billion in revenue in sales in 2029 is half of what it really should be. So we bump that up to $8.3 billion. Now, clearly this chart doesn't make any sense. So let's double all of the projections. Now we end up with something that looks like this. And by the way, this wouldn't be that tough of an estimate to come up with, with a few adjustments to some of our assumptions. But let's imagine this is the one we want to use. We like this better. Where do we think BYND stock is going to be trading at in 2029? Well, that's tough to say just based off of revenue. To use revenue, we would really need some margin assumptions. So let's look at gross margins. In 2018, BYND's gross margins were 20%. And just so we're on the same page, gross margins are how much money a company has after they make their product. So if a company has sells $100 worth of product, and gross margins are 20%, that means that their product costs them $80 to make. Now, this doesn't include things like research and development or selling costs or taxes or interest expenses or anything like that. Just the materials and the costs associated with making the actual product. Okay, so that's gross margins. Now, if we don't use 2018 gross margin numbers and we use the last four quarters instead, well, that would include the first quarter of 2019. Well, gross margins jump to 23%. So for all of 2019, margins are expected, according to analysts, to be 28% and 31% in 2020. And the reason for these jumps in uh, Beyond Meat's gross margins is economy of scale. Economies of scale should kick in as the company gets bigger and they get more efficient at making their products. Analysts are expecting long-term gross profit margins to be about 35%, which is fantastic because if we compare that to other food companies like Tyson Foods, gross margins are 13%. Or Cargill's profits, their gross profit margins are 11%. Then now they're a private company, so I just took the numbers I could find. But either way, that's about where some of the competitors are at. So interestingly, the 35% number would actually be in line with companies like Kellogg's or General Mills, at least from the food sector. And for real this time, this brings us to the problem. So the problem is that we need some way to value BYND stock. We need some measure. We can't use price to earnings ratios because they're not profitable, so PE doesn't work. Discounted cash flow doesn't work because right now they have negative free cash flow. Since we projected out sales, well, it makes sense for us to try to use price to sales. Now, we know that General Mills and Kellogg's have similar margin numbers, at least comparable margin numbers. So General Mills currently has a market cap of about $32 billion, and they generated about $18.6 in revenue in the past four quarters. So we take the market cap, we divide that by revenue, and that gives us about 1.9 times revenue. So that means that the market cap is 1.9 times larger than the size of the revenue. Catalogs looks very similar. So let's say that we believe that Beyond Meat stock has better potential than both of their, those companies. They're healthier, they're better for the environment. We think that they're going to end up being a leader in this space. Let's say that we're going to give them an even 2x slightly above this industry. So using our doubled revenue numbers, we take our $8.2 billion in revenue and we apply our 2x price to sales ratio to it. That gives us a projected market cap of $16.5 billion. But the thing is, that's in 2029. Now, right now, at Beyond Meat's current price of about $175, well, BYND stock is currently showing that their market cap is $10.5 billion today. So even if we're right with our doubled numbers and they have eight plus billion dollars in revenue in 10 years, well, I would imagine at that point that BYND stock is probably going to be trading 
at a more reasonable multiple at that time. Now, let's pretend they are using the 2x and they are truly valued at $16.5 billion. So assuming that BYND stock doesn't fall at this point and they go from 10 and a half or so billion now to 16 billion in 10 years, well, that's only 60%, give or take, 60% upside over the next 10 years. To put that in perspective, the S&P 500 is up about 20% so far this year. Now, if we were able to buy this stock back at the $25 level when BYND first had their IPO, well, that's a fantastic move. But up at this price, I think it's so much more difficult to justify paying this kind of price. And frankly, I think it's not worth the risk in my mind. But what do you think? Do you think that the numbers were too conservative? Do you think we were too aggressive with them? Do you think that BYND is going to be worth as much as we say it could be in 10 years? Please let me know what you think in the comments below. If you haven't done so yet, please hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up. Thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video, and I'll see you in the next video.